Greetings, one and all, once again, back to Exploring Arda, a Tolkien-centered podcast where I am your host, Jackson, and I go through a bunch of Tolkien's works other than Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. And this will be, I think, part three of The Fall of Numenor. Yes, it has been a very fun tale so far. And, uh, yeah, I mean, like, you get, like, the beginnings of Numenor so far and the continuing strife with Sauron as we covered in part two, which was basically like the main threat that is rising again <laughs> after Morgoth's defeat. Uh, Sauron being pretty much just like he knows what he does, or I should say he know he knew what he did uh, during the first age, and now we're back into the second age, and of course he is wrecking havoc. <laughs> Not yet, but he is thinking about it because he went back, and now he's plotting again his evil deeds so uh, we are back at the story again and before i go into the story just uh be sure to check out uh my own fantasy book called the lens of ordia available on amazon and also the bookworm cinema Pro productions which is uh basically this show but only uh <laughs> on the audio side i should say and also uh, my other two podcasts which are drink and dried and books and baggins i would appreciate it if you guys would check those out um there's a lot of my hobbies that i spend in my in my free time uh it's really fun and yeah just check it out so with everything with all that introductions kind of out of the way i'm just gonna go right into the story because i feel very <laughs> motivated to get through a lot of stuff today so feeling feeling a little motivated which is nice so here we go After, right to it so here it says the birth in Numenor of of Silmarion, and when I first read this, I instantly just like <laughs> kind of like an autocorrect of the birth of Numenor, birth of Numenor of Silmarillion. I'm like, that's not right. That's not <laughs> Silmar Silmarion. So here we go. The name Elendil in Quenya had the meaning of a star lover, one who loves or studies the stars, from the words Elen, star, and Dil, friend, uh, lover or devotee with the additional interpretation of elf friend, a common appellation among those among those Idain who had close friendships with the Eldar, from Eled, Starfolk, in referencing to the elves. So, a little uh, brief uh, meaning, I guess, of the word. So, uh, goes on here, says, Elendil uh, was also called Par, par Parmate, Parmate? Hmm, I don't know. I don't know about that one. For, for with his own hand, he made many books and legends of the lore gathered by his grandfather, Tar Vardamir. He married late in his life, and his eldest child was a daughter of Silmarion, born in the year 521, whose son was Valandil. Of Valandil came the lords of Andunie, of whom the last was Amandil, father of Elendil the Tall, who came to Middle-earth after the downfall. Uh, in Tar Elendil's reign, the ships of the Numenorians first came back to Middle Earth. So this was the first, like, literally just like a page and a half, <laughs> just saying like these were the first ships to return back into Middle Earth. And obviously, Elendil was is a very, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say like uh, a common name, but a lot of people know it because of Aragorn's descendants. So uh, yeah, it was just pretty much th that for a quick introduction. And the next one says, the first ships of the Numenorians appear off the coast. So, here we go. Above all arts, they nourished shipbuilding and sea craft, and they became mariners whose, whose like shall never be again since the world was diminished. And voyaging upon the wide seas was the chief feat and adventure of their hardy men in the gallant days of their youth. But the low, oh, hold on. I think the heat just went on, hold on. All right, everybody. So there might might have been a quick glitch there, or like a split second of change, just because uh, a lot of background noise was happening. So <laughs> I'm just gonna restart uh, here. The first ships of the New Norns appear off the coast here. So I'm just gonna re redo that here. So let's do this. Above all arts, they nourished shipbuilding and sea craft, and they became mariners whose like shall never be again since the world was diminished. And voyaging upon the white seas was the chief feat and adventure of their hardy men in the gallant days of their youth. But the lords of Valinor forbade them to sail so far westward that the coast of Numenor could no longer be seen, and for long the Dúnedain were content. Or, should I say Dúnedain, maybe? Yeah. 
<laughs> though they did not fully understand the purpose of this band. But the design of Manwe was that the Numenorians should not be tempted to seek for the Blessed Realm, nor desire to overpass the limits set to their bliss, becoming in enamored by the immortality of the Valar and the Eldar in the lands where all things endure. For in those days Valinor still remained in the world visible, and there Ilvatar permitted the Valar to maintain upon earth an abiding place, a memorial of that which might have been if Morgoth had not cast a shadow on the world. This the Numenorans knew full well, and at times when all the air was clear and the sun was in the east, they would look out and descry far off in the west a city shi white shining on a distant shore, and a great harbor and a tower. For in those days the Numenorians were far-sighted, yet even so it was only the keenest eyes among them that could see this vision, from the mental tarma, maybe, or from some tall ship that lay off their western coast as far it was lawful for them to go. For they did not dare to break the ban of the lords of the west. But the wise among them knew that this distant land was not indeed the blessed realm of Valinor, but was Avalone, the haven of the Eldar upon Eresia, easternmost of the Undying Lands. Thus it was thus it was that, because of the ban of the Valar, the voyages of the Dunedain in those days went ever eastward and not westward, from the darkness of the north to the heat to the south, and beyond the south to the nether darkness. And they, and they came even <laughs> sorry, into the inner seas, and sailed about Middle Earth, and glimpsed from their high prows the gates of morning in the east. When six hundred years had passed from the beginning of the Second Age, Vantur, captain of king's ships under Tar Elendil, first achieved the voyage to Middle-earth. He brought his ship, Entulese, which signifies return, into Mithlond on the spring winds blowing from the west, and he returned in the autumn of the following year. Thereafter, seafaring became the chief enterprise for daring and hardihood among the men of Numenor. Uh, yeah, I'll stop there for now. So... Pretty much, it goes back to the same thing, the warning of, well, I want to say the warning, it's just, it's, they have a band that they cannot go into Valinor, and it's just, just kind of reiterating that, where they cannot go very far west, and the only thing that they see <laughs> is a, uh, is the Aresia Island, which is basically the, the Eldar, kind of keeping track of, you know, the, that border, I guess it would be like the eastern border of Valinor. To protect them, or supposedly to protect them <laughs> from anybody else trying to come into it and, you know, not have a second darkness in Valinor because that would suck. So, <laughs> but uh, it is really cool uh, going over it that they pretty much instead of, uh, I guess, like going back into Middle Earth and settling again, they just decide that that the sailing and all that exploring of the seas is what they are known for, I suppose, and they go into this nether darkness, which is pretty cool, and I actually don't remember reading that, so <laughs> it's really cool. I, I wonder what that nether darkness was actually all about, uh, but I guess this Captain uh, Veantur is is well known among the seafaring folk, which is really cool also. Uh, back to it, uh, I suppose. Make sure everything's set up again. All right, here we go. And the Dunedain came at times to the shores of the great middle uh, middle earth. I was gonna say middle earth, to the shores of the great lands. There you go. And they took and they took pity on the forsaken world of middle earth. And the lords of Numenor set foot again upon the western shores in the dark years of men, and none had none yet dared to withstand them. For most of the men of that age that sat under the shadow were now grown weak and fearful. But for long the crews of the great Numenorean ships came unarmed among the men of middle earth. And though they had axes and bows aboard for the felling of timber and the hunting for food upon wild shores owned by no man, they did not bear these when they sought out the men of the lands. In a lengthy note in Unfinished Tales, Christopher Tolkien quotes from a late uh, philological essay by his father giving a description of the first meeting of the Numenorians with men of Eriador at that time. It was 600 years after the departure of the survivors of the Atani, the Quenya name for the Edain, or men, over the sea to Numenor that, it first, that a ship first came again out of the west to Middle-earth, and passed up the Gulf of Loon. Its captain and mariners were welcomed by Gilgalad, and thus was begun the friendship and alliance of Numenor with the Eldar of Lindon. The news spread swiftly, and men in Eriador were filled with wonder. Although in the first age they had dwelt in the east, rumors of the terrible war beyond the western mountains, uh, Arid Luin, had reached them. But their traditions preserved no clear account of it, and they believed that all the men who dwelt in the lands beyond had been destroyed 
were drowned in great tumults of fire and, and, and in rushing seas. But since it was still said among them that those men had in years beyond memory had kinsmen of their own, they sent messages to Gilgalad, asking leave to meet the shipmen who had returned from death in the deeps of the sea. Thus it came about that there was a meeting between them on the Tower Hills, and to that meeting with the Numenorians came twelve men only out of Eriador, men of high heart and courage, for most of their people feared that the newcomers were perilous spirits of the dead. But when they looked upon the, the shipmen, fear left them, though for a while they stood silent in awe. For mighty as they were themselves accounted among their kin, the shipmen resembled rather elvish lords than mortal men in bearing and apparel. Nonetheless, they felt no doubt of their ancient kinship, and likewise the shipmen looked with glad surprise upon the middle man from... <laughs> oh, hold on. Wow. <laughs> they looked with glad surprise upon the men of Middle-earth, or it had been believed in Numenor that the men left behind were descended from the evil men who in the last days of the war against Morgoth had been summoned by him out of the east. But now they looked upon faces free from the shadow and men who, who could have walked in Numenor, and not thought aliens save in their clothes and their arms. Then suddenly, after the silence, both the Numenorians, Numenorians and the men of Eriador spoke words of welcome and greeting in their own tongues, as if addressing friends and kinsmen after a long parting. At first they were disappointed, for neither side could understand the other, but when they mingled in friendship they found that they shared very many words still clearly recognizable, and others that could be understood with attention, and they were able to converse haltingly about simple matters. And coming among the metal men of Middle-earth, the Numenorians taught them many things. Language they taught them, for the tongues of the men of Middle-earth, save in the old lands of the Edain, were fallen into brutishness, and they cried like harsh birds, or snarled like savage beasts. Corn and wine they brought, and they instructed men in the sowing of seeds, and the grinding of grain, and in the hewing of wood, and the shaping of stone, and in the ordering of their life, such as it might be in the lands of swift death and little bliss. Then the men of Middle Earth were confront were <laughs> confronted com comforted. There you go. I cannot read today. And here and there upon the western shores, the houseless woods drew back, and men shook off the yoke of the offspring of Morgoth and unlearned their terror of the dark. And they revered the memory of the tall sea kings, and when they had departed, they called them gods, hoping for their return. For at that time the Numenorians dwelt never long in Middle Earth, nor nor made there as yet any habitation of their own. Eastward they must sail, but ever west their hearts returned. Uh, and then a little note says, During all of this time, Sauron continued to bide his time and wait until his moment. And it ends here with, He looked with hatred on the Eldar, and he feared the men of Numenor who came back at whiles in their ships to the shores of Middle-earth. But for long he dissembled his mind and concealed the dark designs that he shaped in his heart. Alright, cool. So, that's the... Um, that's the end of the uh, the segment, at least, of the first ships of Numenorians. So the kinship, uh, the the friendship, uh, is at first kind of shaky, but once the Numenorians come back and show them pretty much how to live, which is interesting because it, <laughs> what I gather from this is that the men of Middle Earth are basically like like <sighs> primitives, maybe like. Like they, because it says here that they, the, the new ones came back and they uh, taught them how to like sow seeds and, and gra grinding grains and shaping the stones. So like the metal middle earth seem very primi primitive. So it's interesting to kind of see that. And this is the second age. Um, so I'm, for me, I'm confused as to why that would happen in the first place. I know that this is obviously on the eastern side of the mountains, but of Er Luin, which pretty much. In my view, it kind of like separated, you know, the Middle Earth portion between Beleriand and Middle Earth, and then obviously past all that. <laughs> uh, continuing eastward is, uh, I think it's like Rune and the Desert Lands and all that stuff. Uh, it's just very interesting to see that. And I didn't really expect it to be that low of intelligence, I would say. <laughs> but, and then during this whole time, obviously, Sauron doesn't. I would say he probably doesn't think that he has his full strength yet, and so he's just like, well, I'm going to wait until <laughs> until the right time is true, but he still fears the Numenorians. So, which is also a great 
tie-in as to why Sauron also fears Aragorn in the books of Lord of the Rings. Because it goes back to this, to Numenor and the power that they had. Because they basically resemble elves. <laughs> they basically resemble, resemble the Eldar because the Eldar actually do end up helping them. So, uh, Interesting things, and we'll go back into another segment called The Voyages of Aldaria. So, here we go. Menaldur, son of Tar Elendil, was wed to a woman of great beauty called Almerian. She was the daughter of Veantur, captain of the king's ships under Tar Elendil. And though she herself loved ships and the sea no more than most women of the land, her son followed after Veantur, her father, rather than after Menaldur. The son of Mel Menaldur and Almerian was <laughs> Anarlil. Anar Anar I don't know why I can't pronounce that. Weird. Lover of the sun afterwards renowned after the kings of Numenor as Tar Aldarion. He had two sisters younger than he, a oh man, Elanel and Almiel, here you go, of whom the Eldar married Orchal, Orchaldor, here you go, a descendant of the house of Hador, son of Hathaldir, who was close in friendship with Mendeldur, and the son of Orchaldor and Ainelel was Soranto, who comes later into the tale. All right, keep track of that, guys, because that's a lot of names. <laughs> <laughs> in two paragraphs, so uh, back here again. Aldarion, son of the trees, for so he is called in all tales, grew swiftly to a man of great stature, strong and vigorous in mind and body, golden haired as his mother, ready to mirth and generous, but prouder than his father and ever more bent on his own will. Uh, from the first he loved the sea, and his mind was turned to the craft of shipbuilding. He had little liking for the north country and spent all the time that his father would grant by the shores of the sea especially near Romena, where was the chief haven of Numenor, the greatest shipyards and the most skilled shipwrights. His father did little to hinder them for many years, being well pleased that Aldarion should have exercised for his hard work and work for thought and hand. Aldarion was much loved by Vantor, his mother's father, and he dwelt often in Vantor's house on the southern side of the Firth of Romena. That house had its own key, to which many small boats were always moored, for Vantur would never journey by land if he could by water, and there was a child Aldarion learned to row, and later to manage sail. Before he was full grown, he could captain a ship of many men, sailing from haven to haven. It happened on a time that Vantur said to his grandson, Anardilia, oof, the spring is drawing, drawing nigh, and also the day of your full age, for in that April Aldarion would be twenty-five years old. I have in mind a way to mark it fittingly. My own years are far greater, and I do not think I shall often again have the heart to leave my fair house in the blessed shores of Numenor. But once more, at least, I would ride the great sea and face the north wind in the east. This year you shall come with me, and we will go to Mithlond and see the tall blue mountains of Middle-earth, and the green land of the Eldar at their feet. Good welcome you will find from Círdan the shipwright, and from King Gilgalad. Speak of this to your father. When Eldarion spoke of this venture and asked leave to go as soon as the spring winds should be favorable, Menaldur was loath to grant it. A chill came upon him, as though his heart guessed that more hung upon this than his mind could foresee. But when he looked upon the eager face of his son, he, he let no sign of this be seen. Do as your heart calls, Onya, my son, he said. I shall miss you sorely, but with Vantur as captain, under the grace of the Valar, I shall live in good hope of your return. But do not become enamored of the great lands, uh, you who one day must be king and father of this isle. Thus it came to pass that on a morning of fair sun and white wind in the bright spring of the 725th year of the Second Age, the son of the king's heir of Numenor sailed from the land, and ere day was over he saw it sink shimmering into the, su into the sea, and last of all the peak of the mental Tharma as a dark finger against the sunset. It is said that Eldarion himself wrote records of all his journeys to Middle-earth, and they were long preserved in Romena, though all were afterwards lost. Of his first journey little is known, save that he made the friendship of Círdan and Gilgalad, and journeyed far in Linden in the west of Eriador, and marveled at all that he saw. He did not return for more than two years, and Middledur, Men Eldur <laughs> was in great disquiet. It is said that his delay was due to the eagerness he had to learn all that he could of Círdan, both in the making and management of ships, and in the build of wall, building of walls to withstand the hunger of the sea. There was joy in Romena in Armenelos when men saw the great shift of Num oh, wow. Numeramar, there you go, Numeramar, which signifies west wings coming up from the sea, 
her golden sails reddened in the sunset. The summer was nearly over, and the Eruhantale was nigh. It seemed to Menildur that when he welcomed his son in the house of Vantur that he had grown in stature and his eyes were brighter, but they looked far away. What did you see, Anya, in your far journeys that now lives most in memory? But Aldarion, looking east towards the night, was silent. At last he answered, but softly as one that speaks to himself, the fair people of the elves, the green shores, the mountains wreathed in cloud, the regions of mist and shadow beyond the guess, beyond guess, I do not know. He ceased, and Menildur knew that he had not spoken his full mind, for Aldarion had become enamored of the great sea and of a ship riding there alone without sight of land, borne by the winds with foam at its throat to coasts and havens unguessed, and that love and desire never left him until his life's end. Uh, yeah, I'll lead, um, I have another page or so for this thrilling tale. Uh, so I'm just going to continue that until it's done. So, back to it here. Vantour did not again voyage from, Num from Numenor, but the Num Numeramor he gave in gift to Eldarion. Within three years, Aldarion begged leave to go again, and he set sail for Lindon. He was three years abroad, and not long after another voyage he made that lasted for four years, for it is said that he was no longer content to sail to Mithlon, but began to explore the coast southward, past the mouths of Baranduin and Guathlo and Angren, and he rounded the dark cape of Ras Morthil, and beheld the great bay of Belfalas, and the mountains of the country of Amroth, where the Nandor elves still dwell. In the 39th year of his age, Aldarion returned to Numenor, bringing gifts from Galgalad to, Gilgalad to his father. For in the following year, as he had long proclaimed, Tar Elendil relinquished the scepter to his son, and Tar Menildor became the king. Then Aldarion restrained his desire, and remained at home for a while for the comfort of his father. And in those days he put to use the knowledge he had gained of Círdan concerning the ship making of ships, devising much anew of his own thought. And he began also to set men to the improvement of the havens and the keys, for he was ever eager to build greater vessels. And it says a little note, the year following Aldarion's return, Tar Elendil surrendered the scepter to his son, um, and Aldarion's father Meldur. Okay, so basically the year right after he returns, he is like he passes it down. So interesting. And uh, this one, uh, another note, I guess. There's a lot of notes that concern, like, the kings and queens of Numenor, it says. So, this is Tar Menildur. Uh, it says, Menildur was Tar and Lindo's third child, for he had two sisters named Silmarion and Isilme. The elder of these was wedded to Elatan of Andu Andunier, and their son was Valandir Valandil, <laughs> lord of Andunier, uh, from whom came long after the lines of the kings of Gondor and Arnor in Middle-earth. So, interesting. Menildur was a ma man of gentle mood, without pride, whose exercise was rather in thought than in deeds of the body. He loved dearly the land of Numenor and all things in it, but he gave no heed to the sea that lay all about it. For his mind looked further than Middle-earth. He was enamored of the stars in the heavens. All that he could gather of the lore of the Eldar and Adain concerning Ea, and the deeps that lay about the kingdom of Arda he studied, and his chief delight was in the watching of the stars. He built the tower in the Forest Star, the northernmost region of the island, where the airs were clearest, from which by night he would survey the heavens and observe all the movements of the light of the firmament. When Menildur received the scepter, he removed, as he must, from the Forest Star and dwelt in the great house of the kings of Armenelos. He proved a good and wise king, though he never ceased to yearn for days in which he might enrich his knowledge of the heavens. So. I'm actually going to stop the episode there. Um, I guess, like, as another quick recap for that for that long last portion there. Basically, with um, with Aldarion, he pretty much is in love with the sea and the explorations, and his father knows it, but he still wants him to stay in Numenor. I guess just because it's his kids. <laughs> I mean, I guess it makes sense. Uh, Menildur wants to, wants Eldarion to stay, which he does, but he knows his true love is for the sea. But it is really cool to see that Menildur is pretty much a man of the stars. Like he wants to study what's out, what's up above him, or like uh, what happened with Ea in the past, or what is happening um, throughout all of Arda. So he's very, he's a very um, expansive guy when it comes to knowledge but he never wants to go set out to see at least that's what it kind of gives me the vibe of so 
interesting little segments there. Uh, and I think this one, even though it will be a short chapter, um, but I'll be also recording another one, so pretty soon. Uh, but yeah, that will be the end of this um, segment for the Fall of Numenor. Let me know what you guys think about all this history and lore. Um, there wasn't uh, too much that happened besides like the friendship um, pretty much establishing between the, the people of Numenor and the men of Middle-earth. Uh, you know, pretty much of the, the people from Eriluin and Eastward, they're actually trying to form that alliance and whatnot. So I guess that was like the main <laughs> objective of the chapter. And I, I keep saying chapter, but it's just segments. So let me know what you guys think about the fall of Numenor so far. And uh, yeah, I mean, since this is the end of the episode, just be sure to check out my own fantasy uh, book, which is very much inspired and influenced by Tolkien's writings, um, called The Lands of Ordia, Power of Heaven. It is on Amazon, and I am writing the second book currently. I'm about halfway done, roughly about halfway done, um, writing the first draft. So we'll see if, if it's shorter or longer than the first one. I have no idea. Probably around the same length, but we'll see. I'm, I'm having a great time writing it, and this just encourages me to write more. So, uh, yeah, with all that being said, just stay tuned for another episode. And may the light of Elbereth be with you all. Farewell. <laughs>